The vertebrate nervous system is an incredibly complex topic. Just the human nervous system by itself would be a whole course of study if it were explored in all the detail in which it's known and understood. So this is going to be a very, very brief overview of the basic structure and function of the vertebrate nervous system and a brief overview of the evolutionary patterns that we see in the nervous system. So we're going to start out with the spinal nerve. So let's first just take a look at the overall organization of the vertebrate nervous system. So the vertebrate nervous system is divided into two components. The central nervous system, or CNS, which consists of the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which in turn can be broken into two divisions. There's a sensory or afferent component of the peripheral nervous system, and then there's a motor or efferent component of the peripheral nervous system. The sensory component can be broken, again, into two components. Special sensory, which includes uh, sensory structures associated particularly with the head, so smell, vision, hearing, and taste. And then there's general sensory, sensory modalities that are broadly distributed throughout the body. So this would be touch and proprioception, or stretch sense. These sensory systems can also be broken up into somatic sensory and visceral sensory. So somatic sensory has to do with sort of the external covering of the body, whereas visceral sensory has to do with sensory of the internal organs. I'm not going to separate them out in this schematic that we have here because there's really not anything fundamentally different about those sensory modalities except where they're located. So we have special sensory as part of the visceral system, particularly with taste, is associated with the digestive system. And general sensory, there will be things like stretch receptors in, in the stomach and in the bladder that would technically be considered part of general visceral sensory. But again, there's nothing really fundamentally structurally different about these, so we're going to group them all into just special sensory incorporating both somatic and visceral and general sensory incorporating both somatic and visceral. The motor nervous system can be broken down, again, into two components. This is somatic, so this has to do with voluntary striated muscle, and the autonomic nervous system. Again, this is going to be related to that idea of visceral in that it's generally going to have to do with the internal organs, with the gut, but there is something very, very different about the visceral component of the motor nervous system. We'll get into that toward the end of this web lecture. So the autonomic nervous system in turn can be broken down into two components. The sympathetic, or what we call the fight or flight part of the autonomic nervous system, and the parasympathetic, what we think of as the rest and digest part of it that sort of counters the sympathetic component. And so you can think of the autonomic motor component as being the involuntary, automatic things like your heartbeat and contractions of your intestinal tract and things like that. Glandular secretions are all part of this autonomic component. So to communicate this information from the outside world, process it internally, and use it to produce an appropriate motor response, we have three different types of neurons. So we have motor neurons that are generally going to be multipolar neurons. What that means is that the cell body of the neuron is going to be associated with many different projections. So this is a multipolar neuron. And so these are going to interact with some kind of effector, a muscle or a gland at their terminal. There are interneurons. These are the communicating neurons, the, the in-between ones. And so these are involved in integration. So the interneuron can receive information from either a sensory neuron or another interneuron. It can send information either to a motor neuron or another interneuron. And there can be long chains or relays of interneuron as information is processed in more complex ways. And then finally, there are sensory neurons. And so structurally, these are generally what we call unipolar. Unipolar cells, which means there's just a single projection coming off the cell body. 
and that is the axon. So the axon makes a direct connection with the dendrites and the cell body is somewhere in the midst of the axon. So now let's take a look at the composition of a neuron, the structure of a neuron. Remember, a cell in the nervous system is known as a neuron. A nerve is a group of axons all traveling together to the same region of the body. So neuron and nerve are not equivalent terms. So let's look at the regions of a neuron. So a neuron has a trophic region. Trophic refers to feeding. So this is the cell body. This is where all of the business of the cell is done, all of the metabolism. This is the part that keeps the cell alive. There's a receptive region. This is either a sense organ or it's going to take input from another neuron. So these are the dendrites. And then there's a conducting region, these long processes called axons. These are the part of the neuron that actually travel to different parts of the body. And then finally, there's a transmitting neuron. So these are specialized to communicate with another neuron or a motor end plate or a gland. So these are the axon terminals. So when we look at neural pathways, we often diagram neurons in this way. We use a dot for the cell body and then there's a long axon and then a little um, V shape to indicate the synapse where it will synapse with maybe another neuron, maybe something else. So this would be sort of for a motor neuron or an inner neuron. If it's a sensory neuron, usually it'll be diagrammed this way with a little stick leading to the cell body, some kind of branching pattern to indicate the dendrites, and then again this little V shape to indicate the synapse at the end of the axon terminal. So now let's start to think about how this nervous system develops. Let's review this process of neurulation. So remember, here we have this trilaminar disc with a layer of endoderm, a layer of mesoderm, and a layer of ectoderm. And remember that just above the notochord, just dorsal to it, we get this thickening of the ectoderm to form the neural plate. And that neural plate is going to start to fold upward. And as time goes on, it's going to grow up and form a neural groove. These two sides are going to come and join together to form this completed neural tube and then we have these neural crest cells off to the side of it. And so this is how we get that basic structure of the neural tube. And so what's going to start happening is that that neural tube is going to start sending out these spinal nerves and they're going to run along with these myotomes that are developing from the somites. So one spinal nerve per myotome, and they're gonna travel along together as these muscles develop, and then the nerves will go along with the muscles. And along with these nerves and muscles, we're also getting the dermatomes that are also arranging themselves in this segmental pattern. And the nerves will also go along with the dermatomes to provide sensory input from those dermal regions. And so this is the reason why we get this zebra man pattern with the different spinal nerves, the segmental pattern of sensory innervation across the skin of the body, this zebra man idea. So remember when we discussed the vertebral column that we saw that the individual vertebrae are intersegmental structures, right? Remember they form from the posterior part of one segment of sclerotome, the anterior part of the next segment of sclerotome to form a single vertebral unit. And then in amniotes at least, they come together with these zygapophyses to form these little holes, these little openings called intervertebral foramina. These little holes are going to be segmental. This is where the spinal nerves are going to emerge from this neural canal that's formed by these neural arches. So this is going to be the neural canal and these openings are where the spinal nerves are going to emerge and they're going to emerge segmentally because remember they're right in between these vertebral segments. And so what we see are these segmental neurons coming out. This is with the vertebrae removed all along the vertebral column and each is going to be associated with one of these vertebral units. So in most vertebrates, the nerve cord actually runs the entire length of the vertebral column as a single unit. But in some, such as mammals, which is what this diagram is based on, amphibians, some fish, the posterior spinal nerves 
diverge from the main spinal column before the end of the vertebral column. And so they end up looking like these little wispy strips of these spinal nerves that are going to travel down to their particular segment before emerging, but it's not going to stick together as a coherent unit um, throughout the entire length of the vertebral column. So we call this sort of wispy part of it posteriorly the cauda equina, which literally means horse's tail. So now let's take a look at the general anatomy of a spinal nerve, so one of these spinal segments in an amniote. If we look at a cross section through the vertebral column, what we see is there's a central canal. So remember we have a dorsal hollow nerve cord. So this is the hollow part that's filled with cerebrospinal fluid that's circulating throughout the, the central nervous system. And then there's this area of gray matter in the center that forms this sort of butterfly shape. And then it's surrounded by white matter. So the difference between the gray matter and the white matter is that the white matter consists of myelinated axons. These are projections from the neurons that are traveling somewhere. So that's, it's the myelin sheath around the axon that makes the white matter white. The gray matter is primarily cell bodies in this inner part. So the gray matter has several different regions. So there's the dorsal horn of the gray matter dorsally. There's the ventral horn of the gray matter and then there's a lateral horn of the gray matter. What we find in the dorsal horn is primarily sensory neural structures. So we generally have sensory input in the dorsal horn. The very most dorsal part is going to be somatic sensory. This more middle portion is going to be visceral sensory. In the ventral horn, we have primarily motor neurons. So this middle part is going to be autonomic efferent nuclei, so autonomic motor neurons. And then the most ventral part is going to be somatic motor neurons. These sensory fibers are going to enter the dorsal horn of the gray matter through a dorsal root. So this nerve here is called the dorsal root. And the cell bodies for those sensory neurons are going to be located outside the central nervous system in a structure called the dorsal root ganglion. So remember that a collection of cell bodies outside the central nervous system is known as a ganglion. A collection of cell bodies within the central nervous system is known as a nucleus. So we've got a dorsal root ganglion where the cell bodies for the sensory ner neurons are located. The motor neurons leave the central nervous system through the ventral root. So this nerve here is called the ventral root. The dorsal root and the ventral root will join together just past what you can see here to form the spinal nerve. So we've got afferent or sensory information coming in through the dorsal root with the cell bodies located in the dorsal root ganglion. Here's an example of the sensory cell body. Remember this unipolar cell. And then the efferent signals are going to flow out from the spinal segment through the ventral root. So let's take a look at why we get this arrangement and why the cell bodies are found where they are. So we're looking now at the early development of the spinal cord just after this neural tube closes up. And what we find initially is the single layer of columnar cells. So this is called a pseudostratified epithelium. It looks really thick, but in fact, it's only a single layer of very elongated cells. And this is known as the matrix zone. This is going to be the proliferation zone where cell division is happening. So a little bit later in development, what we see is cells migrating out of this matrix zone and forming another zone called the mantle zone. And in the mantle zone is where these cells are going to start differentiating into neurons. So here we have developing multipolar motor neurons um, here in what's going to become the gray matter in this mantle zone. So here we're looking now at um, a more schematic cross-section through this developing spinal cord. And so we've got a central canal. Remember, that's the hollow part of this dorsal hollow nerve cord. We've got a thin mantle zone, which is going to remain a very thin structure that is generating or undergoing mitosis. 
um, generating the new cells and this thickening mantle zone and we start to see the formation of this other zone called the marginal zone outside. This is where these processes from the developing motor neurons are starting to leave this mantle zone and these axons are going to start to form this marginal zone. So over time we see both the mantle zone and the marginal zone expanding, eventually starting to take on this sort of butterfly shape that we saw before. This mantle zone is going to form the gray matter. This marginal zone is going to form the white matter until we get this definitive structure that we recognize as a typical cross-section of an amniote spinal cord. So this figure has a lot more detail than you need to worry about. Let me tell you exactly what I want you to notice. So this shows the migration patterns of these neural crest cells. So here's the neural crest population sitting on top of the nerve cord, and there are going to be different migration routes. So there's going to be a dorsolateral migration route that's going to send streams of neural crest cells that are going to form things like pigment cells, and then there's a ventrolateral stream that's going to stay close to this neural tube, just medial to the somite. So these neural crest cells are going to aggregate in the segmental way and they're going to separate into two general lineages. Some of them are going to become the sensory neurons, so they're going to form that dorsal root ganglion, the cell bodies of the sensory neurons, and then some of them are going to become glia, these supporting cells that form things like myelin. The developmental origin of these sensory cells is from neural crest cells, which is why we find the cell bodies located outside the central nervous system, and they're going to send projections both inward toward the spinal cord and also outward toward their sensory targets. So this is how we end up with this funny dorsal root ganglion system where we get the cell bodies of the motor neurons located within the gray matter but basically, in the dorsal horn of the gray matter, it's primarily the cell bodies of interneurons that the uh, sensory neurons are synapsing with. So now let's think about neural pathways in the spinal cord. When a sensory stimulus comes in and it's transmitted from the peripheral nervous system into the central nervous system, it can be sent along one or more of three pathways. So the first thing that can happen is that it can enter a simple reflex arc. And so we'll look at the details of exactly how that works in just a moment, but basically this means that the entire pathway is going to happen at a single spinal level. It's going to synapse with a motor neuron at the same level, have a motor output without ever transmitting that information to any other levels of the spinal cord or to the brain. So that signal can go up or down the spinal cord to another spinal level. And so we'll see some examples of that. So we're just going to go either up or down to another spinal level. And this is going to help coordinate complicated movements. Again, we'll, we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Or the last thing that can happen is that it can be transmitted up to the brain for processing. So for integration. Um, and if this happens, that's where you get perception of whatever that sensory stimulus was, interpretation of that stimulus, and integration of some kind of appropriate response. And some combination of one or more of these three things can also happen. So if you think about, um, for example, burning your hand on a hot stove, right? you have the reflex arc that allows you to pull your hand back very quickly and get away from that danger. Um, and that happens really, really fast. But then Kind of after that reflex action, you have the perception of the burning pain. You may think through the process of going and putting some cold water on it, maybe getting a bandage, taking care of it. And so it, more, than, more than one of these things can happen in response to that st sensory stimulus. But these are the three basic um, possibilities. Let's look in a bit more detail at this simple reflex arc. So the example that we have here is sensory information coming from a muscle spindle. So remember these spindle organs are stretch receptors. They're going to detect if the muscle is being pulled and make sure that it doesn't get pulled too far so the muscle does not become damaged. So we've got a spindle organ embedded in the muscle. 
It's going to come through the sensory neuron up toward the spinal cord. Remember, it's going to have its cell body here in that dorsal root ganglion. So it's going to come through here, come in to the spinal cord, and it's going to synapse with an interneuron here in the dorsal horn of the gray matter. That interneuron is going to connect and send its information um, to one or more different uh, motor neurons. So for example, here we've got this interneuron sending an inhibitory signal to an antagonistic muscle to tell that muscle to relax so it doesn't stretch its antagonist any more than it already is. Here we see an excitatory stimulus going to the muscle itself to get it to shorten to relieve that stretch. And so again, we're going to go the dorsal root ganglion in through the dorsal root. We're going to synapse with an interneuron whose cell body is going to be in the dorsal horn. That interneuron is going to synapse in the ventral horn. Remember, the cell bodies of the motor neurons are located within the ventral horn of the gray matter, and then those axons will travel along uh, a nerve, along with other axons, to their targets to take that efferent signal out to the effector. So sensory neuron enters through the dorsal root and synapses with an interneuron in the dorsal horn. That interneuron synapses with a motor neuron in the ventral horn. Remember, the cell bodies of the motor neurons are there in the ventral horn. And then the motor neurons will send an excitatory signal to the muscle and an inhibitory signal to the antagonistic muscle to help relieve that stretch. Now let's think about this idea of information being sent just to different spinal levels. So it's going to travel up. The signal will travel up through the white matter, those axons, to another spinal level, and then that inner neuron will synapse with a motor neuron in the ventral horn of the gray matter at another level. Why would it do this? So this has to do with the idea of what we call central pattern generators. So this is the idea that very complex movements, things that require a lot of different muscles to move in a very coordinated way, are really handled at the level of the spinal cord. It's too much to really have to think through consciously. You don't want to have to bring your brain into these routine tasks. So these are things like walking, swimming, swallowing, these very precisely coordinated activities that just sort of go on autopilot at the level of the spinal cord. And so normally these central pattern generators rely on signals from the brain to initiate and modulate them. So if you want to walk faster, your brain can tell your body to do that. You can modify these patterns, but you don't have to, right? You can just walk completely mindlessly, and once you've started that motion, your body will just keep doing it until your brain tells it to stop pretty much on autopilot. And so this was discovered um, many, many, many years ago when they would actually disconnect the brain of cats from the spinal cord, and they would support the cat's body and put their feet on a treadmill. And as long as the treadmill kept moving, these what we call decerebrated cats, these cats that don't have any connection between their brain and spinal cord, would just keep walking on the treadmill in a very normal way. It looked like a completely normal cat walk. So this is just the spinal cord creating that walking pattern. And we see it in lots of kind of routine, everyday, but complex movements. So this last pathway where the information is carried up to the brain for processing, we will deal with in more detail um, in the next couple of web lectures when we start to think about cranial nerves and the brain. So we're going to leave, leave these pathways here for now at the level of the spinal cord. So now let's take a look at the evolution of the structure of the spinal cord. So this is a diagram of a cross-section through the spinal cord of a lamprey. So myelin is a synapomorphy of the nathostome. So there's no white matter in the lamprey. This is all gray matter. When we start to get into tetrapods, this is where we start to see the, uh, this very distinct kind of butterfly pattern of gray matter and white matter. And then in amniotes, we see this very typical um, structure of the two, the motor ventral horns, the sensory dorsal horns, and all surrounded completely by white matter.
So the pattern in which these neurons are carried also has an evolutionary pattern to it. And what we see in the lamprey is that they have separate dorsal and ventral spinal nerves. They don't join together into a single spinal nerve the way we see in nathostomes. So these ventral spinal nerves are segmental and they carry somatic motor neurons. So here we see all color-coded pink is somatic motor neurons and they're just going to plug into these blocks of segmental uh, muscle tissue directly. These dorsal spinal nerves are intersegmental. They're going to go in between these blocks of muscles and they're carrying all of the other kinds of nerves. Visceral motor, visceral sensory, and somatic sensory all traveling together in these dorsal spinal nerves in between these muscle segments. So now if we look at the cross section, what's going on here, we see we've got these ventral spinal nerves plugging right into the myotomes. These dorsal spinal nerves carrying visceral motor, visceral sensory, and somatic sensory coming off dorsally. We still have a dorsal root ganglion with the cell bodies of those sensory neurons, and these are going to spread out internally to the internal organs and then externally to give sensory innervation to the outer body wall. So now if we look at a lysamphibian, so this is something like a frog, we still see the somatic motor neurons coming out of the ventral horn and exiting the spinal cord through the ventral root, but we also see some of the visceral motor coming also out of the ventral horn and traveling through the ventral root. But still, like the lamprey, we see some of this visceral motor coming out through the dorsal root and traveling along with the sensory neurons out through the dorsal root ganglion and then rejoining the rest of the motor neurons beyond this short spinal nerve. So this is where those two roots join together into this very short spinal nerve before they diverge out to their individual targets. So with somatic sensory going out to the body wall, visceral sensory traveling along with visceral motor and somatic motor to the more interior parts of the body. Then of course, when we get to the amniotes, we see the pattern that we've already looked at with all of the motor neurons being located in the ventral horn and leaving through the ventral root all of the sensory neurons leaving through the dorsal root, their cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglion. And then when we get to the spinal nerve, everything is sorted out according to where their individual targets are. So we're gonna have some sensory going out to the dorsal part of the body. We're gonna have some somatic motor traveling along with that somatic sensory out to the body wall. We'll have visceral, motor visceral sensory going internally um, to the internal part of the body. So now let's take a look at how these peripheral nerves are organized. And so let's step back again and look a little bit more closely at this developmental sequence. So we saw before that these nerves, these are the blue dots are the beginnings of the nerves in early development, are going to be strongly associated with these myotomal muscle buds. So these segmental myotomes, these nerves are going to, spinal nerves are gonna grow out along with these different myotome segments. And so in the body wall, it's just gonna be basically one nerve per body segment. But when we get to these derived appendicular muscles, the fin muscles in the case of the shark, they're gonna be composed of many of these myotomal segments and their associated nerves are going to sort of bunch together and follow these myotomal segments. So what we see is very, very high segment fidelity of these nerves. And this is highly conserved throughout vertebrate phylogeny. The nerves are going to stay associated with the myotomes that they developed with, no matter how crazy those muscles get. So when we get into tetrapods and especially amniotes where we have these muscles derived from these fin muscles proliferating and expanding and subdividing and taking on different origins and insertions and combining in different crazy ways, their nerves stay with them. So what we get are these very, very complicated networks of nerves that are called plexuses.
So this is the lumbosacral plexus. And what we see is these nerves that are formed from different branches of different spinal nerves coming together, joining together, going to all of the muscles that are derived from their segments and just forming these very, very complicated networks of nerves. And so when we were looking at the evolution of muscle groups, one of the ways that we said was a very, very reliable way of figuring out muscle homologies is by looking at the innervation patterns. And this is why there's this extremely um, conservative association between nerve segments and the myotomal segments that are associated with them. So now let's take a look at the visceral part of this. So when we say visceral, sensory, and motor, this term refers to anything that innervates the internal organs, anything related to that, that inner tube, the digestive tube, and things associated with it. Autonomic means something slightly different. So this refers only to motor neurons and motor neurons that are part of either the sympathetic nervous system or a parasympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight or the rest and digest part of this. We have no autonomic sensory system, only an autonomic motor nervous system. So we're talking only about motor inputs at this point. So if we think about the autonomic nervous system, what we see is that the sympathetic stimulation and the parasympathetic stimulation tends to have opposite effects on the same system. The sympathetic is going to tend to increase heart rate, whereas the parasympathetic input is going to calm that down and decrease the heart rate. The autonomic pathways are different from the somatic motor pathways in that they're characterized by a two neuron relay. Uh, so there are gonna be two neurons outside of the central nervous system, a preganglionic and a postganglionic neuron. So what this is gonna do is by having this two neuron relay, we can have some level of integration involved. You can have a signaling neuron uh, send its signal to several other postganglionic neurons. We can have a single postganglionic neuron receive input from several preganglionic neurons. It allows some level of integration right there at the level of the, of the neurons. So let's look at these autonomic pathways now. So sympathetic motor neurons synapse in a structure called the sympathetic chain. So this is going to be located just outside the spinal cord, just outside the vertebral column. And so, um, for example, in a human, if you were dissecting it, you would see it sort of plastered to the dorsal body wall adjacent to um, the vertebral column. And the sympathetic chain is connected to the spinal nerves by these structures called gray and white communicating rami. So here we see them here. Here's the spinal nerve, the dorsal root joining together with the ventral root to form the spinal nerve, and then these communicating rami going to the sympathetic chain. In medical anatomy, these ganglia here where the synapses take place, this is where the cell bodies of the postganglionic neurons are found. So this ganglion in medical terminology is called a sympathetic chain ganglion. In comparative terminology and what your book calls them are just sympathetic ganglia. So now let's look at this whole pathway in terms of an autonomic pathway. Let's start with a somatic sensory neuron. So the somatic sensory neuron is going to bring that information toward the central nervous system. Its cell body will be found in the dorsal root ganglion and then it, the axon is going to continue on in toward the spinal cord, and it's going to synapse with an interneuron here in the dorsal horn of the gray matter. So if that sensory neuron synapses with an autonomic motor neuron, so let's look at this one here, that cell body is gonna be found, remember, in this middle part of the ventral horn. This is where the visceral motor neurons are found, and so that preganglionic, a sympathetic motor neuron, is going to come out through the ventral root. It's going to join up into that spinal nerve, and it's going to leave the spinal nerve through the white communicating ramus. So remember, things that are white are white because they're made of myelinated axons. So this is going to be the myelinated axon of that whole bundle of myelinated axons of sympathetic preganglionic neurons coming through here. 
making this communicating ramus white. Here it's going to synapse with one or more postganglionic neurons. Okay, so in this example, there's a, a postganglionic neuron that's going to go back into the spinal nerve. And these postganglionic neurons are very, very lightly myelinated. So this communicating ramus is going to be a gray communicating ramus because of that lack of myelin or the small amount of myelin. So it's going to go back into the spinal nerve through the gray communicating ramus and out in the spinal nerve toward its target, which might be, for example, a capillary wall out in the skin. It might be sweat glands out in the skin. It can also take another route into a special nerve called a splanchnic nerve that's going to carry it to the gut. So these are going to be the postganglionic neurons that are actually going to have an effect directly on those internal organs. So it could go to the gut, it could go to the heart. Any of these internal organs are going to come through these splanchnic nerves rather than going back out through the spinal nerves. So these, this is the sympathetic pathway. They're going to uh, synapse within this sympathetic ganglion or sympathetic chain ganglion and go either back into the spinal nerve toward peripheral targets or into a splanchnic nerve to go to visceral targets. If we think about the parasympathetic pathways, the parasympathetic motor neurons synapse in ganglia that are either very close to their target organs or sometimes in the wall of those target organs themselves. So these parasympathetic motor neurons are going to come mostly from the sacral region and also from cranial nerves. We'll talk about that more when we get to the web lecture on cranial nerves. So this is often known as craniosacral outflow. Because of this, what we saw just now in the sympathetic pathway, the sympathetic pathways have very short preganglionic neurons. They're just basically coming right out of the central nervous system and synapsing right away, and they're going to have very, very long postganglionic neurons. And the opposite is true of these parasympathetic pathways. They're going to have very long preganglionic neurons and very, very short postganglionic neurons right there in the organ or very close to it. So to summarize what we've done in this web lecture, we saw that the nervous system in vertebrates is organized around somatic and visceral sensory and motor neurons in a peripheral nervous system joined by interneurons with a central nervous system. We saw that the cell bodies of different kinds of neurons are found in very distinct locations because of their developmental origin. So somatic motor neurons differentiate within the neural tube itself and have their cell bodies in the CNS within the gray matter of the neural tube whereas sensory neurons differentiate from neural crest cells outside the CNS, and so they're going to have their cell bodies located in these dorsal root ganglia outside of the central nervous system. We saw that amniotes have distinct dorsal and ventral roots that join together into a single spinal nerve. In the spinal nerve, the different kinds of neurons sort themselves according to the destination and leave in mixed bundles of axons all heading toward the same place. So lampreys have a more simple segmentation and such reorganizing is really not necessary. So we're, they're going to have separate dorsal and ventral spinal nerves. The ventral nerves are segmental, plugged directly into the associated myotome. The dorsal nerves are intersegmental and carry visceral and sensory axons between blocks of muscle to their targets. And then we saw that amphibians have sort of an intermediate state in between those two. We saw that autonomic motor pathways are more complex and involve a two-neuron relay with a preganglionic and a postganglionic neuron. Uh, this allows some degree of integration at the level of these individual pathways. Sympathetic motor neurons synapse in the sympathetic ganglia before the postganglionic neuron travels to its target. Parasympathetic motor neurons synapse in ganglia near their target or in the wall of their target organ. So we saw that Sympathetic pathways have very short preganglionic neurons and very long postganglionic neurons, and just the reverse in the parasympathetic pathways, a very long preganglionic and a short postganglionic neuron.